hand of the Lord rest on you and that the favor of God be with you. I speak over you that as God fits you into this slot of ministry at Albany, that he will give you the wisdom and the mantle and let you fit right in that situation without even any adaptation. There won't even be any orientation, but you'll hit the ground with your feet running. But souls will be saved. Many of them will be saved. God will make an impact on Albany. And that Susan will be happy in her role as a pastor and a minister's wife. That the fear and trepidation and all the insecurities that goes along with that will just, she'll bypass it. Because the days are short. Much work to be done. The fields are white already to harvest. Lord, these are not normal days. That's not a normal church, and this is not a normal couple. Let your hand be upon them, Lord, and let an expeditious work be done. Yes, Lord. And a powerful work. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Bless and amen. God bless you, son. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you, son. God bless you, son. God bless you, pastor said, I have 45 seconds. <laughs> and it would be tempting to talk uh, to many of you and thank you for your friendship and your love and your support of our ministry as we've been here at Brownsville. But more important than any sentiment of our heart towards you is that I would just want to exhort you and to encourage you that we continually come in here service after service and we talk about the next level and the next thing that God's going to do. I'm telling you, the next thing is today. Today's the day. Don't look for the experience. Don't look for the supernatural visitation of God. But I'm telling you that he's given this church and the leadership of this church a grace to take this city. And I'm telling you to open your homes, to get into the streets, to begin to invite, to compel them to come into the kingdom of God. And I believe move now and don't wait for the next supernatural wave and, and moving of God's spirit through this building that we can take this city in short order. And that's really my heart for this church. You know, it's amazing. Isn't it amazing to see how God raises up somebody like that? He even talks like a preacher. <laughs> Hadn't been saved for just a few years. It looks like a preacher and talks like a preacher. Isn't that something? Holy, I'm proud of you, Craig. God bless you and Susan. God bless you, man. <laughs> Remain standing, please. <clears throat> I want to um, say to you today that uh, we are taking up a little bit of time on this Sunday, but sometime we have a lot of things that builds up and we need to deal with them. And one final thing that I want to do today is I want to talk about a new release, a new uh, book that Steve Hill has just released from his ministry. This is something that he wrote himself. There was no ghost writer. Steve wrote this himself. And this is a daily devotional. It's called Daily Awakenings, a devotional by Stephen Hill. He worked on this a long time. I've talked to him <clears throat> all down through the time he was writing this, and he would tell me some exciting things that he was putting in the book. And day by day, he wrote and wrote and wrote until he got this completed, and it's just been put out by Regal Press. And I want to encourage you, pick up a copy of A Daily Awakenings. There's some terrific stuff in here. I've taken the time, and I've read through a good portion of this. This is excellent. It has the touch and the flair of Steve Hill on it, but it also has a wonderful, encouraging, inspirational, but yet a provocative word that each morning when you reach over and get this and read it, it will help you set your day. And I want to encourage you to pick up a copy of this. It's going to be wonderful. And what a great gift to give for Christmas. What a great gift to give away for Thanksgiving. And what a great way to start the new year and a new millennium and a new century by picking up a copy of this book. I believe it would be a tremendous blessing. And Steve, we're real proud of you, brother. God bless you, and I hope God blesses this. Amen. Pastor, one thing about this book, I told Steve this morning, those of you who've been around the revival since the beginning, and you've listened, I don't have to have it, but I'll, I love hawking. Um, <laughs> David, I'm gonna five to five. No, um, <laughs> Something I love about it, I got, I got a copy just a few days ago. If you've been around since the beginning of Revival, you're going to see sermon titles in here. And it's so funny because you go, I remember that sermon. 
I remember that sermon. And I think if you, if you add this to what you, what you have at home in your library, it's going to be a refreshing to you. And I think some of you who remember the early days of what God did here in Brownsville and what, what kind of ministry God brought us with Steve Hill, I think it's going to bless your home. And you're going to remember sermon titles. As a matter of fact, I want, we're going to give a quiz next week and see if everybody. Pastor, it my turn? Well, let's see what we can get into this morning. Let's see. You never know, do you? Two, three, and... Have a little talk with Jesus and tell him all about our trouble. Hear our faintest cry and he will answer by and by. When you feel a little prayer will turn, you know a little fire is burning. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Come on, choir, say it. Now let us Took me in and did a little light from heaven fill my soul. It made my heart in love and it wrote my name of God. And just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. I had a little talk with Jesus and let us tell my But I'm going to do it. I just feel it in my bones. How 
Everybody knows his blood washes you. something different this morning the deacons are gonna come while we're shouting and deliver the elements of communion now let me explain something to you real quickly about communion we all get this religious thing on us when we start having communion sometimes because it's something that has been made religious but let me tell you something if you're hurting this morning if you're full of sin this morning you shouldn't run from the table of the Lord. You should run to it. Because in the Lord's prayer, he said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And I love this section that says, And forgive us our debts, and forgive us our transgressions, as we forgive those who've transgressed against us. So this morning as you come, 
to the table of the Lord, I don't want us to leave it morbid. I think Brownsville needs to start a revolution. We should rightly discern the body of Christ. We should bow our hearts in reverence and humble reverence of the blood and the body. But when we've done that, we should celebrate the fact that it's because of the celebration of the table of the Lord that we can stand in this place. We used to be drunkards, but we're not anymore. We used to be liars, but we're not anymore. We used to be so chained up and bound up Many of us went into pornography and every other kind of evil. And some of us were worse than all of us. We were religious. Religion is worse than all of that piled together because religion makes you think you're okay. When you're a pornographer, when you're a homosexual, when you are lost, you know you're lost. But when you're religious, you come to church, you think you're all right. I'm a good man. I pay my tithes. I come to church. I do that little thing. That's the worst of all because the Lord said, be hot or be cold. If you're lukewarm, I spew you. So today as we come to the table of the Lord, let's celebrate. And if I could have some singers to help me celebrate, I'd appreciate it. I believe if we could tune in our ears to heaven we'd hear the bells of freedom ringing because we're free because we're free all of heaven rejoices because Christ has risen again he's no longer in the tomb Ringing the singing that you can be born again. You hear the bells ringing the singing, Christ is risen from the dead. The angels up on the tombstone said, He is risen just as He said. Disciples that Jesus Christ is no longer
Hallelujah. Everyone been served in the Family Life Center, we welcome you. Now, if you're here today and you already partook of the communion, you already took the cup and you already took the, the bread and you ate it and drank it, it's okay, all right? There's, um, there's people that have just been saved this week. They come to Sunday morning. They've never partaken communion. And as soon as they get the bread and the cup, they just eat and drink. They don't understand. And I remember the first time I saw that, I thought, well, how disrespectful. And I'm going, no, that's not disrespectful. They don't know what's going on. And so uh, I want everyone just to listen to the voice of the Lord this morning. Everyone standing. It was so important what Lyndall said about forgiveness. And Lyndall, I love the song that we just sang. You know, the next time we partake, he said to his disciples, they're going to partake with him in heaven. And I'm going to start thinking like that. We're supposed to be anticipating his return. Yes. And I don't think I've ever done this. I've always, you know, thought of it as more of a somber time. And I love communion. But um, I'm going to start thinking every time I partake of communion, this could be the last time. Yes. This could be the last time. Now, if you were here in uh, Friday night service and... and um, Saturday service, we talked about this week's Newsweek magazine. If you haven't picked one up, we usually do not promote secular magazines here, but I would recommend you getting this week's Newsweek. It's entitled Prophecy, and it says what the Bible says about the end of the world. It's about seven or eight pages of color photographs of hell that were painted three, four, two, and three hundred years ago. It is a phenomenal article on what we believe about the end of the world. And it's written in such a way, it's almost authoritative the way Newsweek wrote it. It's incredible, friend. And it talks about, it says at the very end of it, it says, who's to say the God that created everything, doesn't he have the right to destroy it? I mean, this is Newsweek, friend. And I just got a feeling God is setting the stage for an incredible influx of souls and I mentioned on Friday night that there are businessmen reading that. They're sitting in the airplane reading that, and they've already left the God of their childhood. But they're reading Newsweek and beginning to cry as they read what they really believe. They're not living it, but they believe everything that's being written there. I just believe we're at the beginning of the greatest move of God, friend. And I want to make sure you're part of it. And so if you're here today in the Family Life Center or here in this main sanctuary and you don't know the Lord or you're backslidden, we're going to do something today. We're going to pray together before we ever partake. I'm going to turn this over to Carrie Robertson and, and Bob Rogers, and they're going to lead us in a prayer before Pastor preaches. But before we do that, before we partake, I want to make sure everyone's right with God. What a day to get right with God. Halloween, huh? That'd be cool. You'd never forget that, man. I'd write that in your Bible. <laughs> Take that, devil. <laughs> October 31st, 1999. I got all the sin out. I want everyone to pray this prayer with me right now. We've seen so many people. We've seen probably 5,000 people this week get right with God. It's been an awesome week. But right now, I want everyone to pray with me. And if you've got sin in your life, if you're away from God, this prayer, if you're serious, he will wash your sins away. Everyone pray with me right now. Dear Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, that I woke up with the breath of life. And I ask you right now to forgive me the sin, anything that I have done that has grieved you. Forgive me, Jesus. Wash me, Jesus. Cleanse me, Jesus. Make me new. I repent. Be my Savior. Be my Lord and my very best friend. Jesus, from this moment on, I am yours and you are mine. Come live your life through me. In your precious name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Remain standing. We hold the bread. Lord, you told us to do this in remembrance of you, and so we do it right now. 
We remember your body. Did you, the Son of God, left the heavenlies and came and humbled yourself to be born a baby, a human flesh? And God, in that flesh, you faced every temptation that we faced. And God, it's beyond our comprehension that you could come, the Son, the Son, the Son of the living God, and live in this world. But Lord, you did it as an example to us that we could know that we too could walk in your path. And Lord, we want our bodies to walk in the path of your body. Lives live to the glory of the living God. That's our desire, Lord. And thank you for the bread, Lord, that by it are the stripes that were born upon it, that we can have healing, divine health. As you walked in divine health, God, we can have healing in our bodies right now. We thank you for it, Lord. And God, we thank you that as your body was resurrected, so our bodies will be resurrected, and we will be caught up to be with you forever, Lord. We thank you for it. And God, as we take this bread, we remember you in all that your body represents. In Jesus' name, amen. Take the bread. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. I'd like to invite you to sit down for the drinking of the cup. There's a reason because I want to recognize two people that I want you to see. Last night about uh, 1130 daylight time, we came in from Union Springs, Alabama. We had, we'd been there Friday night and Saturday uh, doing a cleansing stream retreat. And uh, Bob Trahune, for 12 weeks, had driven up there three hours each way to uh, take these people through the cleansing process, about 30 inmates. And um, Bob, I will stand up over there if you would, please. That's the guy that did it right there. And um, uh, through that process, uh, God began to impact that prison in a special way. In fact, there was um, a Satanist, and I say was because it's past tense now. There was a Satanist uh, incarcerated there who had been giving the chaplain all kind of trouble and demanding that, Satan is, uh, that a Satan service be instituted in that institution. And um, if you know anything about governmental institutions, um, when you have religious activities, you have to recognize all religions across the board. But this chaplain is so strong in the Lord and has been so affected by this revival, he just absolutely said, we are not going to, and I'm not going to sponsor a Satanist worship service in this prison. And this guy was making all kind of uh, waves and political problems for this chaplain, but he held his, he held his ground. And it so happened that Chaplain Steve Walker had, uh, had uh, ordered uh, copies of Stone Cold Heart, Steve Hill's testimony for every inmate in that institution. There were 1,100 in there. And uh, so Friday, he was passing those out, uh, the, the copies of Stone Cold Heart, to the inmates. And this Satanist uh, was in the first dorm the chaplain went to to pass out Stone Cold Heart. And when Chaplain Walker walked in there and announced that he was going to give everyone a copy of Stone Cold Heart and uh, what it was about, this Satanist ran out of the dorm and went to another dorm. And wouldn't you know it, the chaplain just went to that dorm second that that Satanist went to. And he went in there and did the same thing again, and the Satanist ran out of there and went to another dorm. And, and he, he was going from dorm to dorm, and Steve Walker was following him without knowing that he was in those dorms. And, and uh, finally, Saturday morning, this guy shows up in Steve's office and says, Okay, okay, I'm ready to receive Jesus. I'm telling you, friends, God is getting ready to do a quick work. And it's because of his crucifixion and shed blood that God is doing these things. And today, we hold within our hands the symbol of the most powerful, the most powerful ingredient that's ever been introduced to this planet. It's called the blood of Jesus. I say it's the most powerful because it's the only ingredient that will wash a person's sin completely and absolutely away. And so, Father, we thank you today for this blood that was shed. We thank you, Lord, that even this blood can dig a Satanist out of this darkness and the steepness of the, the sin of Satanism and can bring him into the glorious light of the gospel. And I shall never forget Jesus yesterday morning as I looked into that man's eyes and I saw that he was alive and not dead. That this man had been brought out of a, a kingdom of darkness into a kingdom of light 
and his life had been transformed in a matter of minutes. And we thank you because of this blood now. We receive it into ourselves, and we ask that you make it into spiritual nourishment for our spirit man in Jesus' name. And let us drink together. Let's all stand again one more time before pastor comes. I don't quite understand why I sing some of these little songs, but this one just keeps going over my head. I'm moving with the Lamb, moving with the Lamb, I'm surrounded. I'm moving with the Lamb. Moving with the Lamb, I'm surrounded. I'm strolling with the Lamb, strolling with the King of Kings. I'm stepping with the Lamb, stepping over. Sing that again. I'm moving with the Lamb, moving with the Lamb, I'm surrounded. I'm moving with the Lamb, moving with the Lamb, I'm surrounded. I'm strolling with the Lamb. in a holy robe, sing. For I'm dressed in a holy robe of God, I'm surrounded by the host of heaven's court. By the Bless the Lord. How many of you brought your Bibles today? Would you hold them up, please? Just get them and hold them up. I love a church that brings the Word of God to church with them. Everybody get, just take time and hold them up there for a moment. Hold it close to your heart. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for your holy Word. When we look at this book, Lord, we realize you wanted us to know. 
You did not want to leave us in the dark, but you wanted us to know. And Father, help this preacher this morning as we get into your word. Help us, Lord, to say the things that this crowd needs to hear, to know you better and to understand life better. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to just say this morning before I minister the word, talk to you for a second out of my heart. I know the time's getting late, <clears throat> but there's never really a good time to say things, you know, because we're always rushed. So I guess we're used to it by now, almost five years later, aren't we? And I'm going to preach this morning until I get through. I don't care what anybody says. So that's done. But I wanted to say today to all of you in the other building and everybody in this building, those of you watching that can't be here with us at Brownsville, but you're part of this great church. I wanted to say to you once again today how much I love this church. This church is the dearest thing in the world besides the Lord and my family. It is the dearest thing in the world to me. I preach in some wonderful pulpits all over this nation. Headed to one tomorrow, tonight. I'll be in Maryland tomorrow. But I don't care where I am <clears throat> and what man's pulpit I'm preaching behind, there's no place like home. I love this church. I love what God is doing. I look out here this morning when Brenda and I drove in. She said, honey, look at all those people. I said, yeah. She said, look who God has sent us. We didn't anticipate what the Lord was going to do, but look, what, look who God has sent us. Just look at this huge family that God has sent to us here at Brownsville. And I looked and I thought my mind, after being here for all these many years, my mind just began to click. And I saw faces that wasn't here, you know, two years ago, five years ago. And I saw that God has brought in a lot of people. And then our core Brownsville people that has stood with us through thick and thin. I just wanted to say to all of you that I really love you. I, I hated to miss the pulpit last Sunday. Um, I was planning on being here, but uh, the builder that built this church, Ken Evans, he passed away, and we had his funeral last Saturday in St. Louis, and uh, he has been a dear friend of mine for a number of years, and the board felt like that I needed to represent the church because this was his legacy. This church was his legacy, and uh, the church that he just built across the street, the Family Life Center that he just built across the street, <clears throat> and we just dedicated last year. Um, that building won a national award, and that was the capstone of all his many years of church building. And it was a wonderful funeral, warm funeral, and I'd like for you to keep the family in your prayers because there's a huge gap there, not only in the family, but in the company, Ken Evans Builders. And I wanted to say too today, uh, I don't ever do this either, and I need to do it more often, but I wanted to say too today uh, how much I love that girl right over there. Come out here and stand by me a minute, you old pretty thing. <laughs> really love my wife. I really love her. I'm so proud of her. Proud of what God has done in her life. I told Steve Friday night, I was looking, I was looking out over the crowd, and I always look over there where she sits, and if she's not there, I don't feel complete. And um, I really don't. And uh, <clears throat> I, I was looking out there with the crowd Friday night, and I saw her little golden hair glowing in that light, and I said, Steve, these women look prettier in the church than they do anywhere else, don't they? <laughs> but I love my wife, and I love my family, my children. Uh, my oldest son is over on the drums. I guess he's still over there. He may be gone by now. He's back there somewhere. Eyes yeah. He's over here? There he is. There's my oldest son, Scott, my youngest son, John Michael, and their wives, Elizabeth and Karen. But I really love my family, and I don't say that enough, but uh, I do. I love my girl, and I'm proud of you. Thank you, honey. I love you, too. <clears throat> Turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 61. And verse 3. <clears throat> and we're just going to forget the time. Okay? Hallelujah. 
Isaiah 61 and verse 3. It says, To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, and to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Now, this verse does not say to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give them, to keep them from ashes and to keep them from mourning and to keep them from a spirit of heaviness. But what he does is he comes in the ashes and the mourning and the spirit of heaviness and he substitutes something for that. But God does not keep us from these things. We've already prayed. I'm going to ask you to be seated. And I'm uh, continuing this morning, part two, <clears throat> on the subject of accepting adversity. Accepting adversity. Now, here's what I'm going to do real quick. I'm going to go real quickly. And I'm going to cover just some highlights. I'm going to read them off. I'm not going to preach them. I'm just going to read them off of the first part of the message. I feel like it's really important for you to get this part in order for you to understand the second part. I'm just like you are. I like to live in prosperity and I like to have my needs more than met. I like to have plenty. I like peace. We're all the same. And there's something about us that our soul begins to wilt when we sense that adversity is coming. God is so faithful, most usually the Lord will let us know he will somehow warn us when something is about to come our way that can throw us. He usually warns us, he prepares us, he speaks to us in various ways, but the Lord usually lets us know when adversity is approaching us. Now, there's an important point here on the front page I'm going to say for just a little bit later, but there's two very important words I want to talk about for a moment whenever adversity comes our way. I want you to give serious consideration to these two words because these two words has a lot to do with how you fare the rest of your life. Now, I know a lot of Christian people. I, my, mostly my ministry is, is ministering to Christians. And I know a lot of Christian people, not only in Assemblies of God and Pentecostal denominations, but other denominations also, that somewhere down the line, something happened to them and they stopped growing. Matter of fact, they got resentful and I'm not so sure that they're backslid. I'm not their judge, but I'm not so sure about what they're backslid. But I know the growth has stopped and I know that many of them have become stubborn and cynical. Some have even become bitter with a root of bitterness in their life. And they have a lot of unresolved things as a strong path in their past. Their past is one strong path of debacle after debacle, one messed up relationship after another one, one messed up church relationship after another one, church hopping, a lot of church trouble in their life, a lot of broken relationships, a lot of preacher resentment. A lot of resentment toward God for sicknesses that hasn't been taken care of like they thought they ought to be taken care of. Things that happened in their family that they didn't understand and they're still holding a little bit of a grudge about that. There's two words I want to talk about real quick before you can move in understanding adversity. These two words is something that you're going to have to pay close attention to. The first one is resistance. When adversity comes, you have the option to resist it, and your natural reaction is to resist. That's why the Bible says in the book of Acts, ye stiff-necked, you do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do you. I want to say to you today that our fathers especially, 
and authority figures in the home, if you don't develop a humility about yourself and an humbleness, and if you don't face life right, if you don't deal with life, sometimes it's not the major obstacles that knock the breath out of you, knock you out. But some of you, you have such little resistance that life just seemingly knocks the breath out of you and you collapse, fall by the wayside, and you, you don't want to learn from the things that you're going through. You don't want to learn from people that God is sending in your life and from circumstances that the Holy Spirit is allowed to happen in your life. You don't want to learn from them. But you either want to bury your head in the sand and ignore them or you want to curse them. But you're not interpreting them. Three things you do when something like that comes along. You either bury your head in the sand and ignore it, curse it, but the Lord wants you to interpret it. God, what are you saying to me through this? What is there in my life that needs sanding off? What is in my, what in my life needs to be broken? Why is this person in my life? What are you saying to me? Then James 4 and 2 said, you fight in war from the womb, from your mother's womb, we humans learn to strive, argue, rebel, protest, and fight. And we grow with that mentality. And when it comes to the things of God, and God's trying to deal with us, we strive with him. We argue with him, we rebel against the Lord's spirit, we protest his word, we protest life, and then we fight against sometimes the very thing that God is trying to use to help us. And the next thing I want to talk about is acceptance. Acceptance is God's command to us. The Bible says in everything, not for everything, but in everything, give thanks. It is the will of God concerning you. Now let me say that one more time. It does not say for everything, but in everything. You have no control over many things that happens to you. And consequently, you find yourself in them. You can curse it all you want to. It's there. You're in the shadows of it. And you either thank God for it and give thanks in it. But the Bible said, in everything give thanks, it is the will of God concerning you. Now, it's not the will of God for you to praise him in everything, but it says, in everything, that's the will of God. And I've often preached to you down through the years that everything is Father filtered, everything. I don't care what it is. Everything is Father filtered. What happened to Job? was father filtered. You can argue with that all you want to, but I've already read in the Bible, in the book of Job, where the Bible says in a conversation between God and the devil that it was filtered through the sovereign hand of God before any of that ever happened to Job. Amen? And I want to tell you right now, whatever you're going through, whatever it is, whoever it is, it is father filtered. So in everything, Give thanks for it's the will of God concerning you. So if you don't thank him for it, and if you don't accept it, you're failing to embrace and to accept what God is doing. And if you fail to accept it and you reject it, you're not going to have a way of escape and you're not going to learn wisdom. That's why there's so many broken things in your past. And the Lord is saying to many of you today in this building and the other building, those of you watching by television and listening by tape, the Holy Spirit is saying to you, and listen to me carefully, if you want to stop that path of strong, broken mess in your life, if you want to stop that, you can stop it today. And one of the ways you can stop it is start embracing and accepting what is going on in your life. Humble yourself, and God will give you wisdom, and the Lord will take a seemingly perplexing mess that there's no way out of, and God will make a way of escape, and you'll come out of it smelling like a rose. But if you reject it, it's going to be one more mess that you're going to have to put up with not only now, but in the distant future also. Let me tell you something else about resistance. Resistance blinds you. 
Resistance blinds you. Let me, let me tell you this real quick, and I'm going to move on in the, in the first message. Let's look, for example, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. The soldiers are coming with Judas to get Jesus. You see a perfect illustration of what I'm talking about, these two words. You see resistance, and you see acceptance. Here comes the soldiers, the torches are burning, the dust is swirling, the crowd is moaning. The torches come around the corner, there's Judas leading the fray. They're asking for Jesus. The Bible says Peter resisted. He pulled his sword. He was aiming for the guy's head, he cut his ear off. I believe the guy moved and he got his ear. Jesus did not resist it. Jesus accepted it. Let me tell you what happened. Peter fell. Peter wasn't even with the Lord whenever the Lord was tried. Peter fell. Jesus stood. Peter was gripped with fear and panic. Jesus was calm in faith. Peter could not see the hand of God at all. Jesus accepted the evil and endured as seeing him who is invisible. Peter resisted and failed in his fiery trial. Jesus accepted it and overcame. He overcame Judas. He overcame Pilate. He overcame the chief priests, the Romans, the executioners, the murderers, the onlookers, and the thief who reviled him. He overcame the devil and he overcame death. Jesus totally overcame and Peter totally failed. Afterwards, Jesus' resurrection, he confronted Peter and he restored Peter. And what Jesus was saying is this. Now listen to me carefully. Jesus was saying to Peter, he said, afterwards when you're converted, go and strengthen the brethren. Now what he was saying was, I believe this. Now you, you don't have to take my opinion here, but here's what I believe Jesus was saying. See, Peter was already converted. Peter was already a disciple of Jesus. He was already following Jesus. So when he said, after you're converted, strengthen the brethren, it wasn't after you're converted to Christianity because he was already a follower of Christ. But what Jesus, I believe, was saying here is, after you're converted to my way of thinking, after you're converted to my way of doing things, and you stop doing things your own way, then you go and I'll use you to strengthen other people. And I believe what Jesus was telling Peter was, Peter, don't just put up your sword, but take it off and lay it down. Now, I won't go into the other part of the message. I'm tempted to, but I'm not going to do it concerning Shimei and David, where Shimei cursed David. But I want to get started on the fresh message. One of the things that we preachers attempt to do, and sometimes I think that we attempt it too strongly, and I've had the Lord rebuke me about it. One of the things that I think we preachers try to do is we try to accomplish a lot in the ministry in the way of helping people. And sometime, it, out of a good heart, we mean well. But sometime, we want to help folks to the point that we want to help Christians understand why certain things happen and why tests are certain as you walk with God and why trials and persecutions arise. Yet in spite of that, trying to help people understand it, sometimes we give the wrong answers. And we don't do it to be unscriptural, and we don't do it to be rebellious against God, but we do it because we love people so much and we hate to see them going through the things they're going through that sometimes we tell people things that we really haven't prayed about and sought wisdom on, and we mislead people into believing that when things happen in their life that it's the devil or it's because of something that they have done and they're reaping that. But I want to say to you today, if I've ever done that, and I ask the Lord if I've ever done that, I repent. I didn't do it out of a rebellious heart, but I did it out of a heart of gratitude and love for God's church. But e, J.E. Broyhill said something that I wrote down yesterday as I was studying and I made my notes. He said, God forges us on an anvil of, of adversity for a purpose known only to him. And that's the way he prepares us for life. Listen to that one more time. J.E. Broyhill said, God forges us on an anvil of adversity for a purpose known only to him. 
That's the way he prepares us for life. Listen to what Oswald Chambers said in his book, My Utmost for His Highest. He said, God does not give us overcoming life. Now listen to that closely. He said, God does not give us overcoming life, but he gives us life as we overcome. The strain is the strength. If there is no strain, there is no strength. Are you asking God to give you life and joy and liberty? He cannot unless you accept the strain. Immediately when you face and accept the strain, you will immediately have the strength. Yes. Now, I want you to turn real quickly to Matthew 5. We're going to be going several places in the scripture, but I want you to turn to every one of them because I want you to see this. Matthew chapter 5. How many of you would be honest today and say, Brother Kilpatrick, in the other building too, even though I can't see your hand, but in here, all in here, how many of you would, would raise a hand and say, I'm in the midst of something that's uncomfortable for me or something that I don't understand? Can I see your hand, please? Yeah, most everybody. And I'm sure it's that way in the other building. How many of you would say, I've been through some things that I still don't understand yet. Can I see your hand? Yeah. Would you like me to give you some good news? There's more to come. <laughs> I want you to notice something. How many of you don't mind marking in your Bibles? Just take your pencil, highlighter, or whatever you have there, and I want you to underline these words. Matthew chapter 5, look at this, verse 1. And seeing the multitude... This is Jesus. Seeing the multitudes, he went up. He went up. Underline that. He went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. I like that. Look this way. You know why I like that? Because it's a perfect picture of life. The Bible says Jesus went up. He went up into a mountain, and that mountain represents where we're taught. Because the Lord teaches us on the mountain so that we can be tested in the valley. How many of you knows the mountain is wonderful? How many of you knows the air is fresh? The view is scenic? The air is cool, the humidity is low, you're all ears. And the Bible said when he was set, I want to tell you something about the Lord. Whenever the Lord wants to get a message through to you, he will always make sure he gets your attention. I'm sure whenever God spoke to Adam and Eve and told them, he said, I want you to be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. He said, but I'm sure when the Lord got ready to talk to them about the forbidden fruit, I am sure that he took them probably by the hand walked out in the garden with him because he walked with him in the cool of the evening and I'm sure he went right up to that tree and he probably tapped him on the shoulder, maybe put his arm around him and he said, hey guys, listen, y'all listening to me? Yes, Lord. Do you see this tree? Mm-hmm. Whatever you do, don't ever tamper, fool with, much less pick and eat the fruit of this tree. I know he got their attention. One thing that I want to say to you today is <clears throat> God will take you up on a mountain before things come your way and he will get your attention and he will teach you on the mountain because he knows that he is going to test you in the valley. Now, I didn't say the devil is going to test you necessarily, but Jesus is going to test you in the valley. 
The same one that teaches tests. Now let me give you an illustration. I don't have time. I'm just going to choose three things this morning for this particular segment of the message. There's other things to go yet. But in this particular segment of the message, I'm just going to choose three things out of the Sermon on the Mount. Now remember, he went up. It's a mount. He's teaching. Got their attention. He's set. They're listening. He's talking. It's going right in. Their pupils are dilated. They're listening, man. They've got their ears cocked wide open. It's going in their spirit. They're absorbing it. They're learning. It's becoming an integral part of them. So he's on the mountain. It's the Sermon on the Mount. He brings out a variety of points. Really, he brings out about 20-something points in his Sermon on the Mount. I just want to choose three just off the top of my head. And I want to show you that whenever he taught them, now remember, he taught them. Where are we at? We're in Matthew chapter 5. This is the beginning of his ministry. You'll also find it over in John. You'll also find it different places in your, in your Gospels. It's the beginning of his ministry. He's got his disciples. All right, he's the master. He's talking. Now... After he talks and after he ministers that message, the sermon up on the mount, he then is going to go with them into the valley and he's going to watch them and he is going to allow circumstances, specifically tailor-made circumstances to come their way to see if they really heard him. Now watch this. What did Jesus say? One of the first things he said was he taught them the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. And he said, they said, teach us to pray. He said, well, look this way, everybody. He, say it with me. He said, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, stop right there. What that is, is he's praying and he's adoring and praising the Lord. Our Father which art in heaven, he's, uh, he's extolling his Father. Now, after that paragraph of exaltation to God, the first practical matter that he mentions is, give us this day our what? Our daily bread. All right? Now, let's see what happens when they come down off the mountain. They come down. Look this way, everybody. Don't look in your Bibles. It's in there. Trust me. Look this way. They come down. Go to John. Go to John. I wasn't going to go there, but I want to share this with you real quick. Go to John chapter 6. Look at what we've got. How many of you remembers a group had gathered and Jesus was teaching? Now, this is separate. This is another account. This is not the Sermon on the Mount. A group had gathered. Now, look this way, everybody. A group had gathered, and after they had gathered, they had been there with him for quite some time, and they were hungry, and some of them were faint. Now, what did the Lord teach them up on the mountain? Give us this day our daily bread. Man, that's groundbreaking information. That is revolutionary stuff. They've never heard anything like that. This is the Lord teaching them how to pray. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, Jesus is out with the disciples, and they're out in ministry, and they've been there a long time. And Jesus, in John chapter 6, look at it. Verse 5, Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company coming to him. And he said unto Philip, where shall we buy bread? Look this way, everybody. Isn't it interesting? Give us this day our daily bread. That should have rung a bell with them instantly. Uh-oh, test time. See? Where shall we buy bread? The teacher's bringing up the subject of bread again. That these may eat. And look at what verse 6 says. Look at this. Here's the teacher. He said 
And this he said to prove him, to test him. For Jesus himself knew what he would do. See that? He's testing him. Philip answered and said, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for these, that every one of them may take a little bit and eat a little bit. And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, There's a lad here which has five barley loaves, two small fish, but what are they among so many? Here's two disciples, the very ones that sat at his feet up on the mountain. Now they're in the valley. There's a great need, a lot of hungry bellies. There's a little bit of bread there, and the Lord is testing them. Won't everybody look this way and listen to me? I can't emphasize this enough. If there's a man of God behind your pulpit, wherever you go to church, if there's a man of God behind your pulpit and he's walking with the Lord and he loves Christ, serves him, loves his word, walks in the spirit and he's not in sin, if that man seeks God for his messages and he gets behind that holy desk and preaches them on Sundays, every time that man of God preaches a message to you, it should always be a warning that whatever you hear is going to be tested real soon. Are you listening? Whatever you are hearing from that man of God that has a fresh word from God, whatever you're hearing, Holy Spirit is warning you that in the days to come, you're going to be tested on what that man of God preached. Let me tell you something else. Whenever I preach myself, I'm tested myself on what I preach. You would not believe some, I could tell you some stories, but I'm not gonna get into that. Now, so Jesus tested them up on the mountain. He talked about daily bread, but now in the valley, he's testing them because the Bible says Jesus knew what he would do. Jesus wanted to see, are you gonna depend on your father to provide your daily bread here? I know there's a lot of people, and I know there's a lad here with a little bit of bread and some fish, but are you going to pass this test? And the Bible says that Jesus told them all to sit down, and then Jesus stood up, and before their very eyes, he took that bread, and he multiplied that bread, and he fed the hungry crowd. They were tested. I want to ask you a question. The next time the Lord preaches to you a message and gives you a message about my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory, I want to tell you there's going to come a test of that very scripture in the near future. When the test comes, I don't care if it's a million dollars, I don't care if it's $60, in the middle of that test, you stand up and say this, I know in whom I have believed. And I know my God shall supply all my need. And I don't know how, but this need is met in the name of Jesus. When I first, I'll just say this. As a boy, an impressionable boy, there was times that we didn't know what we was going to eat, honestly. My mother was a single parent. and There was times we did not know what we was going to eat. My sister's here today, and she can tell you the very same thing. We didn't know. But I remember my mother. I remember my mother. Her words were like God to me. I was an impressionable little boy. And I said, Mama, what are we having for supper? She said, Son, I don't know. But here's what she said. She said, I don't know, but the Lord will provide. And I remember that night, I promise you, I remember that night, a knock came at the door, and there was a neighbor standing there with a, a, a platter of spaghetti and meatballs. And she said, Miss Kilpatrick, she said, I cooked up a bunch of spaghetti tonight for the family, and we didn't eat it, and said, there's a bunch left over. Would you and your family like this? And my mother said, the Lord doth provide. I remember my mother saying that. Today, listen to me, today, I pastor a church that has terrific bills. We have a budget of millions of dollars a year. But every time a need comes up, I remember being that impressionable boy and hearing my mama say, son, I don't know how, and I don't know when, but God will supply. And as a grown man, almost 50 years old today, every time a need comes that just wants to overwhelm me and engulf me and make me want to worry, I remember those words, 
and a calm and a peace comes over me, and I say, Lord, my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory. Can you say amen to that? Amen. The second thing that Jesus taught them on the mountain that they had to be tested in the valley was this. He taught them on the mountain to love their enemies. Go to Luke. Luke chapter 9. How many of you remember in the Bible days that the Jews had a real problem with the Samaritans? Remember that? Are y'all listening to me today? Jesus on the mountain taught them, love your enemies and do good to them that hate you. How many of you know up on the mountain that sounds so good? But how many of you know down in the valley you sure don't want to hear that? Amen? Well, Jesus chose to use the long-standing problem in the feud between the Jews and Samaritans to test his disciples that he taught that to them up on the mountain. So they come down, and Jesus is about to pass through. And in Luke chapter 9, verse 52, we read these words. So we'll go back to verse 51. It says, It came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Well, before he went to Jerusalem, he sent messengers before him, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to try to make a path and to try to make the way ready for Jesus to go to Jerusalem. And they did not receive him because his face was though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, could we call fire down from heaven and kill these jerks? <laughs> Could we call down fire from heaven and consume them as Elias did? He turned and rebuked them. Here's the teacher turning and rebuking them. And he said, you don't know what spirit you're of. The Son of Man has not come to kill men, destroy men's lives, but to save them. And the Bible said they went to another village. So here's another test that when they heard it on the mountain, it sounds so good. Now let me just give you one more real quick. You don't have to turn there, but let me just tell you this scripture. Matthew chapter 5 says, Jesus told the disciples, he said, resist not evil. Resist not evil. So he was testing them. And so sure enough, when Jesus is in Gethsemane, Peter was right there and heard it. Jesus said, resist not evil. If they slap you on one, you turn the other one. If they sue you, give me a coat, whatever. Do that. Don't resist evil. Now, we're to resist the devil. The Bible says resist the devil and he'll flee from you. But the Bible says resist not evil. It says it right there in Matthew 5. Jesus said this. Now, listen to me, friend. I don't care how you're programmed. Just listen to me. Jesus said resist not evil. And so they're in the Garden of Gethsemane. Here comes Judas. Here comes the soldiers. Peter pulls his sword out. He resisted evil. Jesus told him not to. Peter failed miserably. He's a wretch. He's scared. He's insecure. He's full of guilt. He failed. Jesus accepted it, embraced it, and totally overcame everything. I want you to listen to another statement. As a matter of fact, go with me to Ezekiel, chapter 33. Ezekiel 33. Ezekiel thought he was really something. He was telling God how successful he was. You know, we ministers sometimes think we're really successful because we get applause. People write us faxes and send us notes in the mail and tell us how much they love us and how much our sermon helped them. But I found out one of the greatest disappointments of preaching and pastoring is people may say those things, but yet when the rubber meets the road, how many of them does it? Matter of fact, let me take it one step further. 
How many sermons have we preachers preached behind pulpits that when the rubber meets the road, how many of us did them? So I'm putting myself right in there with you, okay? Listen to this. In Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 31, this is the Lord talking to Ezekiel in chapter 33, verse 31. He said, they'll come unto you as people comes. This is God speaking to Ezekiel. He said, they'll come unto you as people comes, and they'll sit before you as my people, and they'll hear your words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goes after their covetousness. And lo, you are as unto them as a very lovely song of one that has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear your words, but they do not do them. Now, I want you to listen to something. Just, just forget that scripture for a moment. Close your Bibles and listen to this. A.W. Tozer wrote this. Listen carefully. He said, Christians habitually weep and pray over beautiful truths, only to draw back from that same truth when it comes to the difficult job of putting it into practice. The mind can approve of that truth, the emotions can enjoy that truth, while the will drags its feet and refuses to go along. It appears that too many Christians want to enjoy the thrill of feeling right, but are not willing to endure the inconvenience of being right. Many Christians are skilled escape artists. I said many Christians are skilled escape artists. Let me tell you something else about the church world. Many of them, even in this revival, and many of you even here today, you are enchanted but unchanged. You can be enchanted with the Word of God, but remain unchanged by the Word of God. Enchanted with the Word of God. It's beautiful. It's truth. It's powerful. It's God's Word, and you're enchanted with it. But it never has changed you. And that's a serious place to be when we're talking about the things of God, enchanted but unchanged. That's why I believe that many people can possibly wind up in hell as a shock and realize when they wind up in hell, they were enchanted, but they were never changed by the Word of God. How many people after I get through preaching say down through the years, oh my, that helped me so much. And yet something comes up in their family that week and they're cursing, they're slapping their kids, they're, they're abusing their family, they're ill, they're mean. And they told me how much it helped them, but yet they were enchanted. It sounded good. They were on the mountain. But when they came off the mountain on Wednesday and the rubber hit the road on Thursday, they were unchanged by what they heard. Are you listening? Now, I want to cover three things with you real quick. What is God doing when he tests us through adversity? I want to share three things with you real quick. Three things. Lyndall's going to come in a moment, and I'm going to have him tell a story about his parents in one of these points. Lyndall, go ahead and get your mic ready and be prepared, if you will. I think... There, here's the microphone right here. What is God doing when he tests us in adversity? Listen carefully. The first thing he's doing is in James 1. Go to James 1. What is God doing when he tests us through adversity? James 1. And verse 21, James 1, 21, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. I'm going to read that one more time. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Now let me tell you what God does. One of the first things God does whenever he allows adversity to come to you 
is that sometime we've got our own thing going. We think that we're pretty well right. We think that there's not much we can learn. We think that we're a good husband, a good parent. We think we're a good preacher. We think we're a good this, a good Christian. We think that we got it together. And we just pretty well, you know, right up there at the top of the totem pole. But God sees the messed up places of our heart. He sees the pride. He sees the arrogance. He sees the independence. He sees the superfluity. He sees the naughtiness of our heart. And so God will allow a tailor-made circumstance to come your way to do this. The word that I'm going to pick out of that verse right there is graft. The engrafted word. The word I want to pick out is graft. You know what you do when you graft a pink dogwood into a white dogwood? You got a white dogwood tree, a regular dogwood tree, and you're going to graft into that dogwood tree that has white blooms on it, you're going to graft in a dogwood tree, but a dogwood that blooms with pink blooms. What do you do? You slit and slice a part of that bark, something that's encapsulated, doing its own thing. You slice it and slit it, and then you cut a point on that other graft that's going to go in to the south of that white dogwood and you graft it down into there. You slit it, you cut it, and you stick it down in there. And you open up the canals of that pink dogwood to the south of that white dogwood. And then you doctrine and you tape it and you leave it until it's grafted in there. What does God do? Look at this. In verse 21, it says, Lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness. What God is saying is, humble yourself. Humble yourself. Don't be so cotton picking hard. And don't be so stupid as to reject the knife of God. He said, receive the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. What God's going to do sometime is God is going to slice areas of your life and he's going to insert his word. You know what Jesus told some people when he's here on the earth? He said, I'll tell you what's wrong with you. He said, my word has no place in you. And there's, there's a difference, friend, in somebody hearing the word of God, but there's also a difference when God comes along and takes his sword and slices you and grafts his word into you. How many of you knows that's when God means business with you and he wants to get his word into you? Let me tell you something. There's some things I know, but there's some things I really know. When I first got in the ministry, God had grafted a word into me of healing. The doctor told me I was going to die. He said, your brain will explode, your heart will explode, or a blood clot will get you. You got polycythemia vera. And I won't go through that. But I was brand new in the ministry. I was preaching souls. I was preaching salvation, and I was preaching to minister to the saints, but I never had had much problem with sickness. So in order for God to have a man behind the pulpit that could minister healing and have a heart for the hurting, I went through a situation in my life where the doctor told me I was going to die. It turned my world upside down. But the Lord came along and said, no, 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 you're not going to die, but I'm going to engraft a word of healing into you. And he slit me, and he stuck that limb down in there, and it was a limb of healing. And to this day, I believe in divine healing by the power of redemption. Now, the next thing is, the next thing that God's trying to do in your life, whenever you're going through a test, is he's trying to enlarge your capacity for truth. Look in Psalms 4, verse 1. Psalms 4, verse 1 powerful verse. David speaking, he said, hear me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayers. Woo, I like that verse. Look at verse 1 one more time. Everybody looking. What is God trying to do when he tests us through adversity? God's trying to enlarge your capacity for truth. Chapter 4, verse 1, David said, Hear me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. You have enlarged me 
when I was in distress. Look this way, everybody. I don't know if it's really possible for God to enlarge us without putting us in distress. You know what I found out? I found out if God left us alone and everything worked real good, we wouldn't even pray. We're lazy. And we won't do until we have to do, most generally. And I found out that most generally people will not do anything unless they have to. So consequently, if that's the way we are as human beings, God is going to allow some tailor-made adversity and distress to come along so he can enlarge us. I want you to listen to this. Successful testing enlarges our capacity for truth. We are enlarged when we pass tests for more truth. Questions are cleared up when you are in distress and God gives you an answer. Questions are cleared up. Scriptures come together. God then begins to give sharper, clearer insight to the eyes of your understanding and your ears really begin to open where you really begin to hear God. David said, you enlarged me when I was in distress. I want to warn you and I want to tell you. As a child of God, God is going to lead you into some situations where you're going to be distressed. But when you're in distress, get control. Grab hold of the reins of your mind. Shut your mouth and say, Lord, you're getting ready to enlarge me for more truth. Yes. Yes. Now, the third thing, and this is where I want Lyndall to come in a moment and share. The third thing is, why does God allow adversity to test us? And this is an area that I could spend a whole message on, but I don't have a lot of time. It has to do with character. Character. God will allow you to be tested to work on your character. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of time here, so listen closely. Successful testing of God. I'm talking about successful testing where you embrace adversity, not resist it, but you embrace it. Successful testing by God establishes character, and your character is the total sum of your daily decisions. Your trials will inevitably reveal your character. I want to tell you something else and listen to me closely. Your prosperity will inevitably reveal your character. When you're doing good in the land, when your bills are paid, when you've got plenty, Let's see if you pray then. Let's see if you read your Bible then. Let's see if you grab hold of the horns of the altar and intercede for revival when you're blessed and all your needs are met. Let's see. God told Israel, he said, Israel, when you come into the land and you got all these things that I'm going to bless you with, don't forget me. And what God was saying to Israel was, Whenever you come into all your blessings, I'm going to be watching your character yes. to see whether or not I can let you enjoy the milk and the honey and let you win the battles and drive out the devil. And let me tell you one other thing too real quickly. You remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount as he ended up the Sermon on the Mount and he said, he said that there was two men. He said one man built his house on the sand and one man built his house on the rock. I want you to listen to me, everybody. <clears throat> Salvation is absolutely free. It is a gift of God, and it is of faith. Salvation is free. It's a gift, and it's of faith. No charge for it. But I want to tell you this. Character is absolutely not free, and it has not a lot to do with faith, and character is something that you earn and that you must eke out 
And character is something that the Holy Ghost is not going to touch you and say you've got character, but character is going to be something that's going to be eked out as God proves you to see whether or not you've got it. Now let me explain to you. The Bible says the man that built his house on the sand, it said that the rains came, the floods came, the winds blew, and it said great was the destruction of that house. It also says a wise man built his house on the rock. It didn't say Jesus built it for him. It didn't say God built it for him. It didn't say the Holy Ghost built it for him. It said the wise man built his own house on the rock. And it said the same thing happened to the wise man as happened to the foolish man. It said the rains came, the winds blew, and the floods rose. And it said that house stood. Why? Because the man was wise and he had character. When he was tested, he did what was right. If he was given back more money than he should have been given back, he goes back to the teller and says, you gave me too much money. Whenever he had the opportunity to watch something on television that involved nudity, when he was by himself, he turned the channel or cut it off and grabbed his Bible and prayed and said, oh God, have mercy on me and help me not to think about what I just saw. That's character. Character is keeping your word when it means you have to really sacrifice to keep your word. You say, I'm going to do something and bless the Lord, you do it. Yes. Come no matter what may. Lennon, I want you to tell that story about your mom and dad. Um, many of you know my parents are pastors, and many of you know a lot of the stories. And when I was seven years old, my mother used to play the organ. She was quite an organist, and my father led song service what we call worship now, but it was song service. And uh, my father was employed at an American can company in St. Louis, Missouri. And my mother and father were so passionate to work for the Lord and had a hand of God, the call of God on their life. So he had a lot of security in his job. It was a union job, if many of you know what that means. So he was, in a, he was a union employee. They had a mutual friend that introduced them to an evangelist who was traveling, having tent meetings. And back when I was seven years old, there was a great charismatic renewal going on in the land. A lot of Catholics were receiving the Holy Spirit. There was a mighty revival going on. My parents became part of this ministry with this man. My father left his job, brought their son, seven years old, and we took off. We went, we went down with the, with the promise of a job from this, this particular evangelist. And... Uh, we're having a mighty meeting, probably three, 4,000 people a night under a big tent. And on the particular Friday night, I can remember it because, I, you know, when you're seven, you can remember a lot of things. And one thing that's been constant in my life is my father's character and my mother. And I've watched them stand for good. This one impacted me the most. When I was seven years old, went to that meeting that night on a Friday night. The evangelist invited a missionary, Steve, to come in and speak and speak right before the offering. And before the offering, now these folks who were getting in the charismatic renewal weren't like some of the Pentecostals I'd grown up with. These were actually people who had money. I mean, these were folks that were Catholics and Baptists and Methodists. They weren't those poor Pentecostals from the other side of the tracks that I knew. These folks had some change. And uh, we really believed that this man was honest, but uh, the, event, the, the missionary was, he walked in and he shared his heart, he shared what he was trying to do. Evangelist stood back up and said, we're gonna receive an offering tonight, and we're gonna give this to the mission. We're gonna give this to the missionary. That night, I remember as a boy, we had those big Kentucky Fried Chicken basket, buckets, how we received the offering. I remember watching the offering come in and people brought it, and it was awesome. But then the spirit of giving just took over and people just started giving, giving, giving. They started pulling watches off and rings off and throwing them in the bucket. And these folks, like I said, they had some really nice watches. And uh, that was kind of that. We went back to our room and uh, settled in and we got a call from the evangelist and uh, he said, uh, why don't you and Shirley, my mother, said to my father, why don't y'all come by and uh, pick us up in our room. We'll go get something to eat before we retire. And I'll never forget this because it was seven years old. We opened the door to that hotel room, walked into that room, and I remember the money from the offering that had been counted. They were sorting it and they were counting it. And I remember as a child, seven years old, that looked like a lot of money to me. I'm sure it wasn't as much as maybe I thought. But the thing that I remember the most was the, past, the evangelist's wife was kind of laying across the head of the bed, kind of on her elbow. Of course, she was clothed and we were getting ready to go eat. 
And there was an enormous pile, probably something like that, of jewelry, Pastor, just laying in the middle of the bed. And like I said, when these folks gave rings and watches, they weren't like out of the gum machine. These were the real thing. And you know how ladies do when they put on jewelry and they try it on and they look at it. And she was trying it on. And she looked at my mother and she said, Shirley, why don't you come try one of these on and pick you one out? Because we know you kids don't have a lot of money. Just come pick one out. And I remember as clearly as day, I can hear my mother's voice now at seven years old. She looked at that lady and she said, I can't do that. And the woman said, well, it's okay. Nobody ever knows. It's just, you know, what are they going to do with these? You can't get money for jewelry anyway. My mother said to her, that money was, that, that jewelry was given to that missionary. And that's where it needs to go. I remember that we had staked everything because my father left his job. And here we were. We were in Louisiana. I won't even name the town. I don't want to incriminate anybody. But I remember my father, of course, we got fired. And uh, I remember we got in our car, we went back home, and we had probably the worst financial time I remember in our lives because we'd gotten rid of our house, sold our furniture, and we were driving an older car. We got home, our car broke down, blew up, the engine totally died. And if it weren't for the grace and the, of God on us, we had a, brother and the, a good brother and sister who allowed us to live in their basement. And my uncle gave us an old... 59, I wish I had it now, a pink 59 Cadillac. And uh, it was one of those that used a lot of oil, a little gas. And that's what we drove in for probably the next two years. My father was unemployed, looking for work, and we would go work and we'd still faithful to our local church. But then ultimately, a few years later, God really blessed us and took care of us and we came to pastor the church of my father, pastors. And what happened, Wendell? You probably don't even realize it, but whenever you were there and your mother said what she did and they made that decision and they got fired, they put everything on the line. They put the integrity and their character on the line for God. The Lord honored that and he touched her seed, which is you, and raised you up to bless the world. I'm closing. Go to one last scripture. Go to Exodus. This is my last one. Chapter 4. I wonder how many times God has tested you and tested you and tested you and tested you and you still haven't passed the test. I really sense so strong in my spirit that there's people that God is dealing with this morning and inevitably will be also by television and by tape that it's time for you to go back and do the first works over again. What you've tried to do is you've tried to bypass an area that God's been trying to deal with you about, and you've been thinking that the Lord's been dealing with you in other areas and blessing you in other areas, but you never have got over this, this situation here. You never got over it. And that has been a weight to you, and that has been a stumbling block to you, and that has robbed you of effectiveness and peace. And you look back over your life, and you've just got one strong mess after another strong mess. And every time God tries to put his finger on that area of your life, you always flunk it. Why? Let me tell you what God did to Moses. This is so simple. The scripture I'm about to read to you is so simple, but yet to me it's so profound. And it has to do with Satan. Look at this. In Exodus chapter 4, Verse 2, the Bible says, The Lord said unto Moses, What is that in your hand? And he said, A rod. And the Lord said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And look at what the Bible says. Semicolon. And Moses fled from before it. 
how many times we have looked over that passage of Scripture. Look this way, everybody. God said to Moses, what you got in your hand there, son? Oh, he said, it's a rod. The Lord said, let go of it and cast it to the ground. Cast it to the ground. And the thing became a, a slimy serpent on the ground. And here's what Moses did. He ran. And you know what happened? I don't know if heaven was embarrassed or not, but look at the Lord's command to Moses. Verse 4, the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth your hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it, and it became a rod again in his hand. Now look this way. Before Moses could ever withstand Pharaoh, he had to deal with that slimy snake. Are you listening? He had to get the victory over a much less formidable opponent. Here's a man that God is going to use to deal with a man that sits on a throne by the name of Pharaoh. He's the ruler of Egypt the greatest nation and the greatest power in the world and the mightiest potentate in the world. And God is going to use that stammering Moses to go before him and to command that I am said to let his people go. But God said, before you, I'm going to let you do that. Let's deal with this rod situation. And he threw it down. It became a snake. And Moses took off and ran. You know what? There's a lot of you that's got Pharaoh on your mind, but you're still running from that little serpent on the ground. Are you listening to me? And that was a test. It was adversity. That was a test. And I'm trying to tell you today, wake up, wake up, wake up. You go through more tests than you realize. And God's eyes are roaming to and fro over the whole earth, and God sees everything that's going on. But you're running from that snake, and God says, I've got Pharaoh in mind for you. Now, let me close out by saying this. Eventually, he reached out. God made him come back, reach out, and he probably took a shaking, nervous hand, reached down, and took that thing by the tail. And when he did, it immediately became a, a rod again. And God used that rod to bring plagues on the earth, God used that rod of that man to stand there and to speak to the Red Sea, and it parted. And after everybody had crossed over, God used that same man to stretch out his rod and close that sea and drown Pharaoh and his army. But let me ask you this question. Suppose Moses would have never stopped running from that snake. You would have never heard anything else from him. You know what I'm afraid of in these days? I'm afraid there's a lot of people just like that in the body of Christ that we could hear so much from if they just deal with those situations where God is testing them. God bless you, friends. Let's stand together. I want us to sing a song. How many feel like there's some adversary right in front of you? Adversity right in front of you. I don't know about you, but I can't remember a week of my life where I haven't had adversity. Anybody with me? It's how we grow. I want to do something right now. Pastor, that's an awesome message. It's awesome. I want to do something right now. Today is um, on the calendar in America. It's Halloween. And um, I just want to remind the devil of something this morning or this early afternoon that he lost 2,000 years ago on Calvary. And I, we're going we're gonna to pray a, a hedge of protection around children that are going to be wandering through the neighborhoods. Friend, if your kids trick or treat, just go down to Walmart and get them some candy. Friend, you're playing with fire having them knock on doors of people that you don't know. And I know a lot of Christians that still let their kids do stuff like that because they, they remember back when they did it. When I was a child, I used to do it. 
When I was a kid, how many used to do this when you were a child? Look here, almost everybody. Things have changed. And there's some plans, attacks against little children in this whole area right now that I believe this prayer that we're going to pray is going to thwart that attack. I really believe that. I remember when I, I walked up to a, um, I was driving down the road in Foley and there was a big sign up. And it says reward, $100 reward for a black cat. And um, someone had, someone's black cat had been stolen. Well, those of you that are into animal rights and you work, you know anything about this season right now, you know this is when they, the animals, the, the, the different dog pounds and all, they won't, they won't let anybody come. They lock up all the black cats for two weeks prior to Halloween. And there's a lot of Satanism in this area, friend. And that cat, I promise you, was stolen by someone that's going to perform some type of satanic ritual tonight. And so if you don't think it's come to Pensacola, you're, you need to wake up. And there are people that are planning evil for tonight. And I want us to pray a prayer. Richard, you got something you want to share on that? I just wanted to let you know in this prayer, I'd like for you to pray. It's 6 o'clock. We're opening the Family Life Center. We blitzed the neighborhood yesterday. Our teenagers did. We had an all-night prayer meeting Friday night. Blitzed the neighborhood yesterday, inviting all the family and children to come. We're having games and, and candy this afternoon. And then we're ending with an illustrated sermon entitled Midnight Cry with a strong salvation message. And I uh, want to ask you to be praying with us. If you want to bring your children or your family want to come, that's fine. But we're reaching out to this neighborhood today. Glory. We're going to pray, and I want everyone to lift up their voice. We're going to pray also, Richard, for those that have been invited. But you're going to lift up your voice, and then we're going to sing a song. And we're singing it to one another and all, but I really want to sing this into the ears of the devil and his demons. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Right now, lift up your voice. Jesus, we bless you today. We bless you, Jesus. We bless you. And we pray a hedge of protection around our children, around the children of this neighborhood, around the children of the counties in this area, Lord. And we pray, God, for this outreach tonight that souls would be won for your kingdom, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. We bless you, Satan. We bind you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let's sing this together. Oh, hell up. one more time but I've never even seen this in this song all hail the power of Jesus name, name let angels prostrate fall Satan used to be Lucifer a fallen angel he knows the power of this song he knows the gospel message he's read the end of the book he knows he's gonna be thrown down he's gonna be in torment forever Satan I just want you to hear it one more time. 